in the high desert in the great American Southwest. West. Welcome to Coast to Coast AM. John, welcome to the program. It's good to have you with us. You're with us. You're with us. You're with us. Welcome back to Coast to Coast PM, the number one unofficial Coast to Coast AM podcast where it's all conspiracy all the time. My name is Paul. I'm the guy who listens to Coast to Coast here with my brother. Hey, Chris here. Uh, I'm the Danny K to your Bing Crosby, except a whole lot less dancing. That is a throwback. How long have you been sitting on that one? <laughs> <laughs> been sitting on that for a minute dude you been know, waiting I, to throw that out been waiting to throw that i had to figure i had to figure out you know got to make sure i get some of the classic pairings out there i'm so excited for this to continue i, I hope it never ends <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna run out eventually when i start getting into like the eddie murphy to your uh robert de niro you know i'm running out of stuff you, you'll have to start going to like south korean talk shows or something that was classic <laughs> showtime for our listeners who weren't aware of that oh yeah maybe a little uh what was it black knight that's also a great it's one that we had on our showtime. show <laughs> yeah but there's not a there's not a classic pairing in that you got to go that's with true. the classic duos i mean yeah. martin lawrence was uh was really a one-man band in that yeah I'm it's mainly thinking of uh, characters, all the all the bad DVDs that were on our shelf growing up. So, Chris, we have a big episode today. We are going to be talking about a gentleman by the name of Bob Lazar. Bob Lazar, dude, he's aliens, isn't he? He is aliens, UFO yes. specifically, and Area yes. 51. I'm pretty sure I've seen him on one of those... Uh bad amazon documentaries you definitely have uh, i believe it was a year or two ago his his documentary was released and oh, that perfect. is that's going to be the topic of today's uh episode is a, a special episode of coast to coast where george knapp who discovered bob lazar interviews jeremy corbell who made the documentary along with oh bob lazar. so we're actually going to be talking about the documentary a little bit, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm cool. mainly using it as a way of getting into Bob's story. So I cut yeah. out a lot of Jeremy's pitching. There's there's a lot of, you know, you got to watch my movie. You got to pre-download my movie. You got to buy it on Vimeo type shit. Yeah, you got to cut cut all that stuff out. Yeah, there. That, gonna, it's, uh, yeah I, don't, unless, I don't care about Unless that. we get paid, we're cutting all that stuff out. Now, Jeremy, if you're listening and you if you're do want to pay Jeremy, us, <laughs> we will sell out. We will add those back in, but for now they're clipped. Yeah, for now they're gone. But Chris, before we get into Bob Lazar, the amazing story of Bob Lazar, Area 51, his time there, the nine UFOs that he saw, and what happened since, including him being raided by the FBI just a few short years ago. Wow. We have to check in with our good friend, Tim Banal, on I mean, the Coast to Coast AM yes. blog. I, I can't wait to see what treasure out of the treasure trove you picked out. <laughs> so we, Timmy Banal, we picked a fun one today. Here's okay. the headline. Danish man arrested three times in one day during bizarre crime spree. Okay. So this guy got arrested three times in one day. So let's, let's jump into this socket. This is not paranormal. I don't know why it's here, but I kind of enjoyed it. So we're going to just say in. that only in Europe, could you be arrested three times in one day? I feel like in America, like you're just the arrested once. Yeah, you don't get out. You don't get <laughs> they out. They don't let you out. You're loitering. You're done. You're yeah. finished for at least the week. Yeah, this this speaks to their entire criminal justice system that yeah, this is even possible. So I mean, they got murderers doing like 12 years over in the Nordic countries. I mean, that's insane. Well, yeah, we'll we'll deal with that on a we'll deal with different so, well, criminal different justice dump. system is a different conspiracy for a different day, huh? <laughs> Total different beast there, buddy. <laughs> so, Chris, <laughs> police in Denmark arrested a man three times over the course of a single day, in okay. which the gentleman was a veritable one-man crime spree. <laughs> According to a local media report, the curious case began on Monday morning when the unnamed suspect was taken into custody due to an arrest warrant that had been issued by the court. 
While the situation was apparently resolved and the man was released, it was only a matter of hours before he wound up in hot water with a law again. Later that morning, he was busted for allegedly shoplifting from a convenience store in the city of Nykobing Falste. Wow, I don't dude. know how to say that word. Gotta what is it when there's an O in a line in it? I don't dude, know. Dude, the Danish, it's, a, it's an alien language. <laughs> I mean, quite <laughs> literally, it's an alien language. Yeah, when uh, when people refer to the tall whites, they actually just meant people from Denmark. Not they mean, well, they mean the Nords, dude. <laughs> yeah. They absolutely mean the Nords. I mean, their language is incomprehensible. It is true. So this gentleman, suggesting as if there were any doubt that the 28-year-old suspect is no master criminal, police say that they caught the suspect suspected thief when he returned to the store to retrieve his cell phone, which he Oops. had accidentally left behind prior to exiting the shop with a backpack full of goods. Although arrested and charged with shoplifting, since the crime was petty in nature, the man was soon back out on the streets, whereupon he proceeded to find himself once again in police custody a few hours later. So this guy... Dude, I mean, just typical millennial. <laughs> you gotta get the cell I, phone. You got a bag full of goods, my dude. Why are you taking the phone out? It's like he made it. He he stole the stuff. He got out. He wasn't arrested. And then he goes back for his phone. That's insane, dude. But you know what? They always say that that criminals go back to the scene of the crime. Like it's classic policing. You wait around to, for the guy to show back up after he just shoplifted. Yeah, they were probably just waiting there. And in walks this kid, and the clerk was like, yeah, the the blonde, the tall blonde. <laughs> <laughs> tall blonde 28-year-old. And the kid's just like, uh, did you see my phone anywhere? Unbelievable. Terrible, terrible. So that's that's arrest number two. Okay. In this particular instance, police responded to a call, so instance number three, about a person roaming around a popular dock in the nearby town of Stubico Bing. Once again, butchered it. And, and see, uh, that's the problem with, with your Nordic countries as well. Everything is near water, right? So just like classy, seedy, you know, like mafioso type material right there. Always Just 1800 shipyard, you know, yeah. very gray. Right. Exactly. You yeah. know, a lot of places you can hide out behind a lot of like overweight dudes driving forklifts <laughs> and stuff. I mean, CD stuff is always happening in these places. And they're all drunk on rum for sure yeah. <laughs> rum, yeah. specifically rum barrels yeah, of rum specifically rum, rum. yeah dude T typical longshoreman you know very true so concerned residents at this particular dock called the police because they were concerned uh and said that there was an individual brandishing an axe when the cops arrived on the scene they arrested the man for the third time that day and charged him with violating a law surrounding the carrying of weapons while it was uncertain what became of the miscreant after that, one hopes that Monday's multiple encounters with the authorities will cause him to reconsider his life choices, lest he wind up in handcuffs yet again. I mean, dude, that had to be a busy crime day for Denmark. I feel like you don't hear about a lot of crime in that place. Well, it's all because of the one guy. Just the one guy. Yeah, they just it was keeping... probably the same cop. <laughs> <laughs> like... It's just one cop on a bicycle. Yeah. In these like, cities in Denmark, dude. yeah, he's like, I'm having to pot <laughs> bicycle miles just for one guy. It is terrible. And you know what? I don't think he's going to reconsider his life of crime. I think he probably needs some mental health services, which yes. Denmark has plenty of. So they'll has probably be able to help wonderful him mental health services. Carrying around an axe in a shipyard is typically a bad move. That is true. I would say carrying around an axe anywhere but right next to a pile of lumber is <laughs> not the coolest thing to do. <laughs> Unless you're in a forest and dress like a lumberjack, don't carry an axe in public. Yeah, I don't know if there's many situations where I'm comfortable next to a guy who has an axe. Maybe if yeah. it's Home Depot or if he's next to his wood pile. Those are the two situations. I mean, quite honestly, the guy who brings an axe camping, I'm not that comfortable with. I'm like, dude, what? are you planning on doing with that thing? I, uh, I may be that guy. <laughs> You're the guy that brings an ex camping dude. Right. Everybody <laughs> hates you. It's everybody the, hates you. Dude. I bought one. It's the only time I get to use it. 
It's like a guy who brings the acoustic guitar camping. Let me, are you that guy too? No, I don't know how to play guitar, but. Okay, good. I have gone camping with that guy. Yeah. And he sucks, right? You're like, nobody wants to listen to you play bad renditions of like, you know, Bob Dylan songs. Yeah. Well, the the worst was I went camping once and I was uh, in the general area of a Boy Scout troop and the Boy Scout leader guy i don't the adult person in the room yeah. was playing his guitar and he was terrible and it ruined my night so oh yeah, uh, yeah. just if you are going to bring a guitar sing softly or be good I think a lot of green songs. sleeves and hot cross buns very true so chris on a scale of one to five barrels of rum how much do you believe denmark exists uh it's a part of the neverlands where i believe peter pan is from so zero bottles of rum i would completely agree with that analysis no rum for denmark that was our tim Bennell corner so i think it's time to jump in to bob's story all right i'm excited dude i've been waiting for some aliens man buckle in so the thing about about bob lazar right so this was a four hour episode led by george knapp mass specifically about bob lazar so it's four hours of content or they just huge. Yeah, they go through a story. So what I've done is I brought out the highlights for us to review yeah. today. So we'll hear from George Knapp about uh, his time with Bob, because uh, he was actually the first person to discover Bob Lazar and okay. report on his story. We'll listen to and Bob. George Knapp is just one of the general second tier uh, hosts for Coast to Coast AM, right? Correct. Yeah. So okay. originally George was, he's an actual reporter uh, and Ooh. he's like won Peabody awards and stuff. Like he actually does. <laughs> wow. He, he's yeah. a he real does, guy. He does real reporting. <laughs> unlike some people who host coast to coast. He, he's been taking seriously by some groups of people. Yes. At some point in time, he was a serious or taken seriously. I'll say that. I like him. I, he's probably my favorite host on coast. To really? Coast. Yeah. Okay. So we'll hear from uh, uh, George, we'll hear from Bob, and we'll also hear from Jeremy Corbell, who made the documentary in the past couple of years about, um, about Bob and breaking down his story. Yeah, and but it's like before, on Amazon, yeah. right? Amazon Prime, for any of you who want to go out and watch it. Yeah, if you just search Bob Lazar into Amazon Prime, you should be able to find it. It's actually pretty enjoyable if you do want to yeah. understand what his story is. Right. But before we do that, I thought it would be helpful just to break down what the the main hits of his story are so that when we do hear them everyone can be a bit familiar with them yeah because uh, it can be disjointed bob's gotten a little older his storytelling has gotten a lot worse yeah and i was gonna say i could use a refresher over who bob lazar is yeah so for the uninitiated in in the bob lazar story bob lazar was a gentleman that claimed that he was an mit and caltech graduate and physicist who worked at the los alamos national laboratory so a smart guy, smart guy, yeah. allegedly, allegedly smart guy, <laughs> allegedly smart guy. His yep. resume, if I was taking a look at his resume, I'd be like, this is a guy who's smart. Definitely, definitely. So at Los Alamos, and if you are familiar with Los Alamos, it is a lab ran by the U.S. Department of Energy, and it was created as part of the Manhattan Project. So right. it's old school, like you know, heavy into conspiracy. If, if you look at the Manhattan project, you know, you can make up a lot of stuff about Los Alamos, but it's still running to this day. Well, um, a lot of people would think that like the department of defense runs all of our nukes. It's actually the department of energy mm -hmm. that runs our nuclear program. And that includes missiles, mm -hmm. which is weird. I don't quite know the history of that, but I guess, I mean, it makes sense for like nuclear power, but yeah, they also are in charge of the nuclear arsenal. Right. So Bob's story is that while at Los Alamos, he had Q security clearance, right? Which I just love bringing up because uh, also reminds me of uh, Behold a Pale Horse and uh, Billy Coops. So Billy Coops, Billy Coops, man. So Bob was recruited, according to him, to take part in a secret project at a location called S4. Right. Because he's a super smart guy. Because he's a super smart guy. He's an out-of-the-box thinker. He once right. attached, uh, like, a rocket to a car uh, and then, like, blasted it down an uh, uh, empty lake bed, and it went really fast, and then he was in the newspaper. So he's like, oh, I was a really smart guy. I was creative out-of-the-box thinker. I yeah. loved, like, you know, engines and stuff like that. I'm always doing crazy and wacky stuff. Yeah, wacky guy. Wacky, wacky guy. guy. He talks a lot about how he converted his car to hydrogen power, right? Wacky stuff. 
That's wacky. Uh, it's kind of fun too, you know. It, and he talked about like hydrolysis on an old Art Bell episode for like thirty minutes. It was cool. It's pretty funny. So he says that he went to go work at S four, which is a facility inside of Area fifty one, which is the very famous location where the U.S. government allegedly holds or held ufo craft and holds or held alien bodies depending on who you're talking to after the roswell crash didn't they take it to area 51 that is part of the roswell story is that things went to area 51 yeah okay cool. uh but a lot of the area 51 fame didn't really come until bob's story in i believe it was 1988 was when it was first okay time. So he helped bring Area 51 like really into the light, right? So we almost have like a 30, 40 year span where where Area 51, no one's really talking about it. Oh, yeah, I don't think really anyone's talking. It was kind of known that it existed yeah. like a lot of military bases, but it wasn't the center of a lot of the UFO talk like it is today. Right. So Bob was working at this this S4. And the reason why he says he was there was that his job was to reverse engineer nine flying saucers that he said were extraterrestrial in origin. Nine. Uh, we have nine. Not, at least nine of them. Yes. He called it like a sampler pack of flying yeah. saucers. So we had all nine. kinds of different types. Yeah. The most famous he called the sports model. Uh, and it was kind of the <laughs> classic one that you see. <laughs> we got the sports model. We got the the sedan. We got the minivan. We got the truck. You got to there's a UFO for every situation, you know, right. you got to have them covered. So the way that he says that these saucers ran was by an antimatter reactor that have used, to, has to be antimatter. Can't be anything else. Yeah. What else would it be? Anything well, else can't be sense. anything. Yeah. It wouldn't make sense. Yeah. So antimatter reactor that used element one or one fifteen as its fuel source. Okay. So at the time in 1988, the element that has 115 protons uh, had not been discovered yet. I think we were like one or two elements away. But basically the way that these these elements work is that in a uh, uh, huge collider, they smash atoms together and then they'll, they'll like throw a couple extra protons onto an existing atom. And they're like, oh, look, we made this new element now. And it disappears within a billionth of a millisecond, right? Yeah, like the um, last 15 elements are all like that. Yeah, they, they don't last. Uh, they disappear yeah. super fast. So he said that there was a stable version of element 115. Um, and since then, it has been discovered. It's called uh, Moscovium because it was discovered in Moscow. So I don't trust right. it. Uh, so and it, it decayed literally in, in milliseconds, right? Communists. Yeah. You can't trust it. So what he said was that the way that this craft would fly is by going belly first and then falling into a gravitational distortion field that the antimatter generator had created powered by element 115 that allowed it to fall forward at a very fast speed. Right. So like me doing a, a belly flop into the pool. Yes, but sideways. But yeah, well, yeah. that's the only way I do belly flops. Yeah, so if you do it sideways, so that way they're, they're basically making a gravitational like distortion field in front of you and then you fall into it. So right. that way it's not like you're using necessarily propulsion. It's like you're using gravity to power yourself. So yeah. that's how he says right. that these, these things flew. Classic. And they, yeah, classic. And they also bended gravity. So... By bending gravity, that also bends light. So depending on where you're standing around a UFO, you may or may not be able to see it. Right. Which is kind of fun. Yeah. And that also fits in with a lot of stories of people who see UFOs because two people standing next to each other, one of them may see it, one may not. So it's kind of a thing of like, depending on your angle, you may not be able to see the light because of the gravitational distortion field. This is all tracking. Yes. So he also said, <laughs> I've been watching a lot of Doctor Who lately. And as writing this, as I was writing this, I felt like I was like reading a Doctor Who script. But um, basically, he, he said that these saucers allegedly came from Zeta Reticuli, which is a star system 40 light years away. Okay. You read a document. And this is a real star system actually exists. Yeah, Zeta Reticuli actually exists. If you're familiar with the Barney and Betty Hill UFO abduction case, um, I believe that was back in 1961. That was where these two people were abduct abducted in New Hampshire. This is where they said those aliens came from, was Zeta Reticuli. So we're, we're, we're developing a story here. Yes, very it's much all so. all building on top of each other. Continuing the thread, Betty and Barney said that they were abducted and taken there by aliens from there. And then he's saying that these ships came from there as well. Right. So that's Bob's story. Uh, it came out during an interview with uh, George Knapp, right? So 
George and I have interviewed him at first. He gave him a fake name, blacked out his face and stuff like that. And then eventually came out and said, I'm Bob Lazar. And then this is my story that I worked at Area 51. And Knapp is doing this for like a real newspaper or news station, right? Like He's, this yeah. is this is supposed to be real reporting, not coast to coast AM. Correct. Whoa, whoa, Chris. Uh, that was <laughs> that was facetious. That low was blow. Facetious. You're low right. blow. You're absolutely right. But you are right. He was doing this for a real news station. Okay. Uh, not coast to coast back in 1988. So at this point, George tried to fact check a lot of the claims, uh, like that the, that this guy went to MIT, that he went to Caltech, that he worked at Los Alamos. And all of these organizations say that there was no record of Bob ever being at the organization. Yeah, dude, but they would say that. That's the thing. Bob says it's because his records were wiped by the U.S. government to discredit him. The CIA has been saying that they didn't kill Kennedy for 70 years. They have been saying that for 70 years. So that's what he says. They, they're trying to discredit him while critics who we don't like say it's because he's not actually a physicist. He never went to school at MIT or Caltech and he never worked at Los Alamos. As a They got to his college records. <laughs> If you believe that he did go to MIT and Caltech, then yes, they got to his college records. Dude, those those secret government agencies are, dude, they are tricksters. They'll come after you. Now, the other argument is that he never actually went to these places and it's all made up. I don't like that argument. It's less Keep fun. Keep going. All right, Keep so going. let's go in and uh, we'll, we'll hear from George Knapp about how the world first met Bob Lazar. Right? Let's do it. I want so to he'll, know. He'll, quick breakdown from... The voice of George now. straight from the I called up John Lear. I said, mouth. Hey, he had Lear had told me in late 88, so 30 years ago, that he knew a guy he thought was going to get a job at, at Area 51 and might know something about ET technology out there. So I called Lear up, said, Hey, you think uh, your saucer buddy could uh, do the interview? And Lear calls back, Yes, you have to black out his face. So we did this interview with a guy, the shadowy guy named Dennis, blacked out his face. And he first told the world this incredible story. So that was the fake name. They called him Dennis, blacked out his face. And he Dennis, the, the, the flying saucer guy. Exactly. And one of the interesting things here is that, and this is used to discredit him by his critics, right? So I want to make sure to provide both sides of this story, uh, is that Bob Lazar was friends with John Lear, which is okay. the, the person that uh, George Knapp just referenced. John Lear was a ufologist uh, who in 1988 had written a book called The UFO Cover-Up, and in 1989, he was the state director of MUFON, which is the organization that investigates UFOs. Okay. So there are those that say the fact that he's friends with John Lear discredits him because he already kind of had that bug in the system, and him and Lear probably planned this together. For Does this he time. work with the guy from Blink-182? Bob or are John? Different, either of them. I don't think that the guy from Blink 182 works with either of these people. Bob okay. doesn't really work with anyone. He's actually pretty low key about this. Yeah, uh, he doesn't go to conferences. He doesn't do talk shows usually. Uh, it's pretty much when this movie came out that he was actually doing interviews. These are all points in his favor. And not, and I would say that they are right. The fact that he doesn't actively monetize off this. Yeah. He has he has a, a company that he runs. Uh, and it's like a chemical compound company, like they help with like nuclear detectors and stuff like that. So, I mean, he somewhat knows what he's talking about. Yeah, he's definitely a scientist. Yeah. Right. Whether that's like self-taught or he actually was a physicist, I think that's kind of up for debate. Unless the government scrubbed his records. Unless the government mean. scrubbed his records. Yeah. So George then goes in and he asks Bob, Hey, why did you come forward? Like break it down for us. So yeah. he's going to, he's going to kind of give you the beginning of the story of like why he was triggered to actually talk. It's a great Nash question back in 1988. Yeah. Why'd you do this? The hours they were calling me to go to work were really odd. And some of the times it was, you know, later in the evening, anyway, to make a long story short, uh, I would get called, you know, odd hours saying it's saying it's 456 now um, within, you know, an hour or so you need to be at McCarran Airport and, you know, get on a flight there and, you know, go out to the base. And this happened, you know, fairly frequently. And my wife at the time began to think that I was having an affair. So he goes on to explain that because his wife thought he was having an affair, she started having an affair. 
Oh, man. Yep. And he had also agreed to have his phone and uh, himself basically watched and wiretapped. Right. So the government then noticed that the affair was occurring and they stopped calling him in for work. Interesting. That's because, nice of the government, though. Well, the reason why the government did it was because they didn't trust him anymore. Because if you're going to be working top secret projects, you don't want there to be like instability or potential yeah. dirt or anything like that right. on the employees. So that Back way, the gays, dude, you couldn't be gay and get a top secret clearance like this. Yeah, I believe it's called being gay, not the gays nowadays, Chris. Oh, but sorry. <laughs> yes, you could not be gay and, and have a top secret clearance. You're right. Um, so yeah, because this is 1988, it, it was you know government was was it's a little messed up about stuff but the, he's he stopped getting called in so at that point he's like well you know screw it you know they're not calling me in uh i need to prove to my wife that i'm not cheating on her and that i actually was going to work so she he brings her and two other friends out to area 51 when he knows there were going to be test flights at night he yeah. goes see the he's test like flights. look see the ufos yeah see you, you see the the disc in space yeah and i was working on that yeah, exactly. That was me. So I'm the flying saucer guy. <laughs> he is the UFO guy, the saucer guy. <laughs> so at that point, uh, the police pick them up and uh, he tells them who they are. And once he tells them who they are, they call back to the base. They let them go. Right. So like, OK, he's Bob Lazar. He works here. Yeah. Uh, but the government finds out that he had people there that he was showing. Uh, and let's just say the government did not like it. Government doesn't like that typically. No, Paul. Yeah, they don't like it when you take people to secret bases, apparently. Not taking secret bases and showing them top secret inventions, I guess. Yeah, showing them their their uh, nine UFOs is not yeah. preferred. <laughs> we, we recovered this from an extraterrestrial crash. Uh, please don't show your wife and friends this. And your wife and your neighbor. <laughs> yeah. That's not the coolest thing. That's so, not cool. And as a natural result, he started being followed. Yeah, well, of course. I began to get a little concerned. Everywhere I went, I was being followed now, where I wasn't before. And I started to get a little concerned about this. Um, they had already given me a lot of classified information. And... Now there's no response when I call the person, my contact out there, they're not calling me into work anymore. So I started getting a little concerned. And this is when I first started telling some friends about it. So he told his friends and people were kind of finding out. And then he started getting really scared and started packing heat. So Bob Lazar Dang, was dude. carrying around an Uzi. At this an point. Uzi? <laughs> an Uzi, yeah. Dude, but he was, he, yeah. Those those folks out west, dude, they're wild. They are wild. They started telling more people because uh, he thought his life was going to be in danger. Because right. He's like, and oh, the more I, people, yeah. you know, <laughs> the more people, you know, the better. Yeah. Yeah. It's how you protect yourself, because then when they take yeah. you out, then everyone's going to know that what you're saying was true. It, it was the secret government organization that runs UFOs. Exactly. Right. And we know where it went from there. Uh, subsequently, after you do that interview, you get called from Dennis Mariani, your su superior, who, oh, my gosh, he was pretty upset. And then things got worse. Uh, Mario referenced uh, carrying a gun. And um, I remember going to your house after there had been a break in and you're peering out of the window uh, holding an Uzi. And, uh, you know, as I've said earlier in the program, I don't know if you're able to listen to it, but. Those things were real. That was really going on. I just want to know, where do you get an Uzi from? Well, this was uh, this was back in the 80s. You could buy an Uzi back in the You 80s. could just buy an Uzi? Yeah, you just get an Uzi back in the 80s. Yeah, I got, a, I got an Uzi guy. <laughs> Freaking automatic weapon. Yeah, no, they were actually really popular in the 80s because it was before body armor advancements. So, like, a lot of, like, skyjackers and, like, bands of terrorists would have Uzis. I was going to say, it seems it's like a street gun, dude. You do a, a drive-by with an Uzi. That's not like uh, a Bob Lazar MIT Caltech scientist is like, oh, I'll take the Uzi. I, so to me, this feels like something that Bob felt was cool. Yeah. Because I, I just don't understand like why the Uzi is the thing that you grab. No, dude, I think like a big, dirty, hairy revolver, dude. That's what I'm getting. Yeah, or a, a pistol, you know, yeah. 
a, a rifle of some sort. I don't know, just the ooze. The, also, if you've ever seen Bob Lazar, if he kind of looks like Stephen King with glasses. Right, he's a real nerdy looking dude. Yeah, very nerdy looking. The thought of him just peering out the window, holding up an Uzi while George Knapp, the reporter, is in there is just such a funny image in my head. Do you think he had like a holster sling or do you think he just like kind of kept it in his uh, belt buckle, you know, just kind of in the belt and the waistband, you know, and just kind of like kept it the the shirt up a little bit. So like everyone in the house could see it like, yeah, I'm picking it. Was, yeah. I think it's much closer to the waistband <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> At one point he was, cause it sounds like he was just walking around with it. And then he also talks about how he left it in his car once Oops. and him and his neighbor, you know, put it in the glove, uh, glove compartment because like you do with your Uzi right you just throw right. it in the glove box they go inside to grab something come back out and the car had been like rummaged through and the Uzi was left on the passenger side seat whoa yeah. dude that was definitely the feds yeah because he was like it had to be the feds they just want to know that they were there because who would break into my feds. car and not steal the Uzi yeah dude that was the feds yeah had to be feds so Basically, he was he's being, you know, followed, he's being threatened, but eventually it, it does pretty much die down for now. We'll get to what happened in present day a little later, right? We're still in 1988. 1988. So while Bob was at Area 51, they actually let him get onto one of these UFOs. So we got right. to see what it was like. Well, of course, he's he's fixing it. He's, you know, making it stronger. He's got to study it. And so, like, you would have to get on the UFO to do these things. Yeah, you know, because he, he's reverse engineering things. So right. he's got to be like the whatchamacallit feeds into the, the yeah, spring of a jig. The doohickey is exactly. connected to the doohickey. Yes. And then you were like, okay, and then this is how we make it. And this is how we beat the Ruskies. Right. So here's a little bit about him actually getting on. The if UFO. only they knew in a few short years, there would be no more Ruskies. <laughs> Well, they're, they're still there. It's just <laughs> not communist. <laughs> Russia's not gone. <laughs> this no longer exists. Scale of one to five. How much do you believe Russia exists? Oh, dude, that's definitely a one. <laughs> yeah, I was permitted inside to see uh, the components that I was working on were the power and propulsion system. And they were on different levels in the craft. And, you know, as I've mentioned before, there's no physical connection between the components and subcomponents. There's no wiring. They just need to be near each other to operate. Um, so because the placement might be critical was the only reason I was allowed in the craft to see where these devices were. So I thought that was pretty interesting, right? That there's no wires. There's no, no connections. It's just different mechanisms that function based solely off proximity. That, that that isn't surprising at all. I mean, we're already starting to get into that capability with like Bluetooth and stuff like that. I mean, we have we have iPhones that you just like sit it on a block and it charges. I'm waiting for my whole table to be a charging mechanism. And that way I don't have to have any cords anymore. It's coming, dude. I'm telling you, we are so close. So none of that is that surprising to me. All right. So he found what we, I guess <laughs> so, we can agree on is 2020 technology. You don't like that. They're like, oh. All right. Well, whatever. Yeah, right. I was going to say, dude, you sound like you're 75 years old. Like there's no why is anywhere. I thought it was cool. Have you Where been the cathode a- ray tubes? Have you been on a plane? There's so many wires on planes. <laughs> I want it wireless. Where, so, where are the vacuum tubes? <laughs> it's a series of tubes. <laughs> oh, God. All right. So, uh, you know, he's like, working. Welcome to the 21st century, Paul. So, Come on. So, so far, you aren't impressed, Chris. Is what yeah. Uh, all of this makes total sense to me. <laughs> So Bob goes on to talk about the, how this was a really poorly ran scientific project, right? right. It, it was really slow going for a lot of different reasons because the government just wasn't doing this very well. Typical government bureaucracy. Yeah, this is, this is both a pro and a con to a story. And, and I, we'll, we'll explain why in a second. Really, I mean, as hard as it is to believe this, it wasn't all that organized. These, these, these guys were really fighting over themselves they're trying to do it with, you know, a group of researchers that is way too small. And 
you know, they're interfering with free discussion between them, which is where ideas and problems are solved. So it's I, the project, in my opinion, at that time was run very poorly. So essentially what they had was 22 total people working right. on this project. They were in a buddy system. Yeah. So they had a buddy that they were allowed to talk to and they're allowed to work with, but they weren't allowed to talk to each other. Right. That's similar to how the Manhattan Project functions. I was going to so, say, this is Fordianism at the end of the day. I mean, yeah. basic managerial, you break up tasks to their smallest components and you make sure that nobody has a full picture of the whole entire process. Removing the workers from the means of production. You're absolutely correct. Yeah, why did these guys unionize? Uh, because you're deep within the bowels of the U.S. secret government, dude. There's no <laughs> unionizing. That makes sense. So, one of the here's a pro to a story based off this: that it's a secret government project that is being very poorly ran by really dumb people who don't know what they're doing. I completely believe that. By, by that, totally, hundred <laughs> percent. I mean, you've been around governments, Chris. Yeah. That feels right. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I again, as I've said before, nothing he has said yet has me skeptical. So here's where I'm skeptical, though, is that he says that there are 22 people that were working on the project. That was it. He said there were 22 people who knew about this. We had like uh, over 100,000 people working on the Manhattan Project. I just, I feel like if we had nine UFOs, we'd have more than like an average of 2.1 people per UFO working on it. So let me uh, throw a, a big old wrench in your skeptical gears. I don't think that they are the only 22 on this project. I think that was the only 22 that Bob knew about. Oh. I don't think there's only nine UFOs. I think there's probably, you know, dozens of UFOs scattered, not through only our country, but through several countries throughout the world. There's probably some on the moon right now, dude. <laughs> Are we going to secret moon bases right now? I'm talking secret moon bases. You're dude. talking secret moon bases. I'm trying to talk Bob Lazar. You're talking secret moon bases. I, and listen, there's definitely at least several secret bases on Antarctica and the North Pole. So all of that to say that your little, I'm going to poke a hole into this, BS. But here's the thing. He's very certain that there are 22 people who knew about this, right? And you're right. He Maybe he, was, maybe he didn't know about it. But let me actually expand on this for a second, because he also said that he was constantly called in at weird hours of the day. Right. So it was like, you know, literally all time, day or night. It was super random. He had no understanding of it. If there was a rotating group of individuals who were going to the space to even study these nine, he likely would not have known about it because he was going in so randomly. But so I think the 22 is fine. I, but what I'm saying is generally there were probably teams of 22 folks throughout all these secret bases. Yeah, and that's what I was saying. Even on this base, they could have been rotating in different teams of 22 people. Yeah. He wouldn't know. He was only he was there super randomly, different times of the day, different times of the night. They could have just been like, all right, we're calling in team like 18 today to work on this specific thing. So they call them in, they come in, send them back out. And they're like, all right, we're calling in team 23. You know, something like that could have been happening too. I don't, I'm not. Anyways, whatever you're you're fishing now. I'm fishing, says the guy talking about moon bases. Yes. Okay. You're fishing. Cool. All right. That's fish. fair. That's fair. All right. So let's get to element one fifteen. Yeah. I want to know more about that. Everything hinges on element one fifteen. It's it's the only way for this to work. Okay. Element one fifteen is what you would call the fuel that propels the craft. It. Uh, it doesn't burn like a conventional fuel. It's used more like an atomic fuel. Um, and really to, to cut quickly to the second part of the question, which I think is more important. Uh, I mentioned element 115, which was theorized, you know, way back, you know, in the 60s, maybe even the 50s, that there, there could be some elements that are stable, uh, you know, higher up in the periodic chart. And for those who aren't that familiar with chemistry that uh, you know the chemical elements once they reach 92 they become like uranium plutonium and the heavier the element the shorter half-life they have they literally disintegrate they emit radiation they fall apart 
Okay. Again, so far, nothing out of the ordinary there. Nothing out of the ordinary. So what he talks about with Element 115 back in the day was that there was a theorized island of stability where all these really heavy elements are very unstable, right? And they have a very short half-life, which means that right. they decay really fast, right? Yeah. But there was the theorized island of stability where there was a segment of heavy elements up the periodic table that we just have not gotten to yet that are stable. They go stick right. So there's like a stable, there's like an unstable range. You have stable elements above or below 95. Then you have like a period from like 95 to like 125. And then after 125, you get stable again. Well, what he was saying is like up until like 113, it's, it's, uh, well, sorry, like 113, 114 is unstable, but 115 is, un- is stable. Okay. So by 115, we're back to stable. Yes. So okay. he, here's the problem with that 115 is not stable. Yeah. I, all of these are still highly unstable, right? Yeah. So what is, what is his response to that? Because we have since found it and it disappears in seconds. He said this would not happen, right? So okay. was he wrong? The material on the craft, as I said, was stable, but this is this is a normal thing, and a lot of people have a point of contention about this. They got look, you said element one fifteen was stable. They made it, and it wasn't. Look, all elements have stable and non-stable versions of them. So basically, he's just saying is that we have not found the right isotope, right? right. We haven't so ions and stuff like that. Like how many neutrons? Mm -hmm. are supposed to be on to add stability to the uh, proton and electron, you know, soup. Yeah. An example that's given is that there's multiple versions of hydrogen, but there's only one stable version of hydrogen. Right. So he's like, we just haven't found the right version of 115 or Moscovium uh, that, that will actually stick around right now. They're all disappearing. We're essentially children throwing marbles at each other hoping hoping to get like a friction bang still yeah that's not actually i don't think for for my layman's understanding that's not really a bad way of describing what happens in these colliders we're just smashing shit together we're just smashing (laughs) shit together dude i mean it really really is and we're children about it you know we should have already created a mini black hole at this point dude we're we're nowhere we're absolutely that nowhere. Would have been problematic considering the, the colliders are on Earth. We're still a type zero civilization, dude. We're worthless. According to Doctor Who, we're category five. So that's something. No, that's wrong. That's a wrong category. I, I like, like it. That categorization. <laughs> I'm, I'm a Who fan lately, dude. I'm a Who fan. All right. So Corbell, the gentleman who made this documentary, uh, who is very adamant about how true everything that um, Bob Lazar says is. Uh, that Bob Lazar has been maligned, that the ufologists out there who attack him, because he's very contentious. He's very contentious in the UFO community. Yeah, dude. He just spent like five years making a documentary. I would probably be defending it a little bit as well. Yeah, but it, just Bob Lazar in general, like he has been yeah. attacked a lot. His story has been attacked a lot by mainstream ufologists. So <laughs> Mainstream ufologists. <laughs> Which is a relative term. <laughs> In terms of the mainstream of ufology, <laughs> yeah, and within within the uh, the <laughs> academic professional uh, realms of ufologists, listen, Bob Lazar, highly contentious. There are well-respected, educated individuals in ufology. Whether or not they're well-respected and considered educated outside of ufology is a different thing. Yeah, where does the guitar player from Blink One Eight Two rate on your? Uh, hierarchy of ufologists oh he's an 11 out of 10 dude <laughs> <laughs> he's he's god tier if, if we're gonna get disclosure it's because of him <laughs> <laughs> you know what's sad that might be true i mean honestly it it could be we'll find out soon so when i was listening to what's my age again in third grade i did not see this guy going and testifying before congress about ufos well i always loved the song aliens exist and it just made me so happy that it turned out that that was a really accurate title this guy really thought that aliens existed they they, no i'm telling you that song is true that's every word of it man it's true 
All right. Anyways. Okay. I need to hear about why Corbell is so stoked about element 115. Yeah. So here is, is Corbell, the uh, director, the writer, the independent filmmaker uh, who made the Bobblestar documentary. Talking a- Ator. About Ator. A- Ator. Is that yeah. the, that's the preferred nomenclature. Preferred okay. nomenclature. Uh, okay. A- Ator. You've uh, found some that uh, have different opinions, right? I, I didn't find some that have different opinions. The UFO, you know, people that, that look into the physics, they're, they're absolute idiots. I'm sorry. Bob is right. You are wrong. I called around the world from Russia to San Francisco to Washington, D.C., across the board. They're telling me that we cannot rule out a stabilized form of element 115. It depends on the isotopes. It's exactly what Bob told us, you know, all along the way. Okay. So again, nothing out of the ordinary there. Yeah. And, and here's the interesting thing about this, right? Is that Corbell, he, he seems to use this as like a proof point, which I don't think is necessarily fair. Uh, that is correct. You cannot rule out a stable version of 115 because we have not smashed together every version of element 115 that's possible yeah um that to me doesn't really prove anything that doesn't prove bob correct i think there would need to be a stable version of 115 that is found to in some way prove that bob was correct you know what i mean but the 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 universe is a big place paul big place we could find it maybe that maybe this all is true but we have not found it yet and the the lack of us finding it He's saying, well, we haven't proven it wrong yet, so it's correct. And I, I think that's just, a really bad way to go about it. Just ants throwing marbles together, dude. Throwing sewing marbles together. So Corbell continues on about, you know, evidence that he found that Bob is right. Like new hard-hitting evidence from this documentary. You got to watch it. You got to go on Vimeo, buy it, yes. and get the extra features. He talks a lot about the extra features. This is one <laughs> of the things of the extra features. The I extra- hope I hope to God there's bloopers, dude. That's the only extra features I ever want to see. That would be great if there was bloopers. It's like Bob messing up and saying that everything was fake. That that's, would be great. The, that's the exact <laughs> blooper I had in mind. I'm just kidding about it all. Got you guys. Gotcha. Oh, cut that. Cut that. Cut that. Cut that. Cut that. <laughs> all right. So here's here's his evidence. Look, there, there's a guy, Jim Tagliani. Where, you know, some of you are familiar with him. He worked at Area 52. I mean, he literally got his clearance ripped just for knowing Bob Lazar. He mentioned to someone at Tonopah at Area 52, hey, you should listen to this guy that's about to go on the news report. And then by the intelligence uh, you know, officers that were dealing with this, you know, dealing with the fact you put Bob on the news, they pulled him aside and they started questioning. Taglatani, dude, that's an Italian name. So that is a point against Bob Lazar. Oh, lost the point. We're Italian. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know my people, dude. You can't uh, trust us. We'll say anything, dude. Did you forget momentarily that we're Italian? <laughs> Whoa, dude. Italian? Don't like that. I hate that, dude. No, uh, that. Dude, Italians are papists. I guess so. <laughs> But here's, okay. here's the problem, though, yeah. is that there's no actual evidence to back up Bob's story, right? And we can say that it was because, you know, his records were wiped. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you, you could say that about pretty much anyone who's making up a story. And it could be true, but there still just isn't evidence to support what he's saying. The most that we can come up with is that Corbell found a guy who said he got, like, questions because he said, watch Bob Lazar. That's something. I don't really know if that happened or not. If it did, it could just be you know, their concern over the, what this guy wasn't vibing in that he was potentially spreading conspiracies about UFOs. Yeah, um, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not after you. Yeah, it's true. You know, I've seen, what was that, uh, what was that movie with the black helicopters? Whatever. Conspiracy Anyways. theory, dude, with Mel that's Gibson. It. That's it, with Mel now. Gibson. That's classic, Yeah, man. The, <laughs> the crazy taxi driver, and it was yeah. all right. Um, the other thing that he found was he found one guy who worked at Los Alamos who said that he knew Bob was a physicist. He didn't work directly with them, but he had seen him there. And um, he was like, no, I definitely knew that he was a, a physicist, right? Dude, that opened the door, man. He, the guy felt, you know, classic, like, government scientist feeling bad about lying. You know, he can't tell a total lie, just but like a half lie, like a he, very, like, Boy Scout Mormon thing, you know? <laughs> In terms of about a, a Bob working there? Yeah. Yeah, Listen, so I, I can't say that he worked at Al- Los Alamos, but I knew he was a physicist. 
So that's the thing is that we have this one guy who said it, but there are a lot of other people who said that he wasn't a physicist there, that he was a contractor. So let's actually go into uh, George Knapp's uh, attempts to actually verify Bob's story, right? Because okay. there we, we got to get something to back up what he's saying, so right? You always leave a paper trail. There's right? got to be a paper trail. There's got to be a paper trail. Because when we started trying to verify bits and pieces of Bob's life there in 1989, after the shadowy Dennis interview and before we unveiled his identity to the public in November of 1989, uh, so I'm trying to verify what I can. And and Bob had said that he was uh, undergoing review for this upgraded security clearance. I said, well, who's doing it? You know, and he had he said, well, the guy worked for an agency. It's like the FBI but I don't think it is the FBI, and he knew the name. It was an odd enough name that I figured, well, I might be able to check that out. Turns out that the agency that he worked for is something called OFI, and I never... All right, so he's like, I need a background check. There's this weird agency called OFI that checked me, right? So George okay. Knapps, he's just following all these trails because everywhere he goes is a dead end. Los Alamos... I, like, I don't know what don't OFI is. What is OFI? It, it's uh, an agency that does background checks. Okay. For the for the US government. And it is real, right? It's real. It's okay. real. Yeah. What is that? What does OFI stand for? Uh he may say it. If he doesn't, I'll Google it while uh he talks. Never heard okay. of it before. The Office of Federal Investigation. And sure enough, go. that agency, that outfit, does background checks for people who would go to work at the Nevada test site. Perhaps I don't know if they also did it for Nellis personnel, but they were involved with people who worked at Groom Lake, Area 51. I called him up. Sure enough, an agency that I didn't know existed was real. And they really did have a guy named Thigpen who would not talk to me at that time. All right. So that's something, right? That's something. That's something. And we got, a, we got an employee's name and we got a relatively obscure government agency. That most people probably don't know about. Yeah. And he was able to say a person who worked there who likely would be checking backgrounds. Now, here's another potential issue with that. Uh, it has been shown that that Bob was very likely a contractor at Los Alamos, right? Right. Um, one of the, the things that George Knapp found was there was a phone book that had Bob Lazar's name in it from Los Alamos. because This was 1988 and he had phone books for the for the organization. A phone book, Paul, you may have to describe what that is to some of our younger listeners. So it was this magical thing <laughs> where they would print out your name and your phone number so people could call you on a hard line. And this was in a giant yellow book <laughs> that weighed about 30 pounds. And it had everyone in your area's phone number on a home phone that was connected to a phone line that ran through everyone else's house in your neighborhood and in your town and city. Really easy to tap if you're the government. Um, now, this this specific phone book was was for Los Alamos. So it was Los Alamos employees. He's on okay. It. But a contractor is listed as his employer. Okay. So they reached out to the contractor. The contractor said, yeah, we'll find his records. They couldn't find the records. Now, what is thought by the people who have looked into Bob Lazar and do not believe him is that he was a contractor. He was probably some sort of kind of like contracted, uh, like an electrician or engineer or something like that, that he wasn't actually a physicist. Um, and that potentially he did get uh, some sort of security clearance to be there. And right. that's how he knew this, but he wasn't a physicist there, and he still didn't work at Area 50. Just to just to poke a, a small hole in that, you know, I, I I generally agree with the logic, but like government contractors way make way more than government employees. I mean, it's stupid, and so this guy is like throwing away a cash cow so that he can say UFOs exist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, though, is that he actually still gets government contracts. Really? Yeah. His his uh, his company, which does like, you know, um, yeah, he said like nuclear devices or something Yeah, like or... radiation devices and chemicals, uh, different compounds and stuff like that. Uh, he he claims that they still get government contracts. Like, it's just that <laughs> good, dude. They're just like, well, damn. He's the best. He's the, Well, he says that it's like the left hand not talking to the right hand situation. It's that like he, right. he works with people who have no idea who he is. Right, 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 right. I mean, and that's not that shocking either because this is a whole different level of the government that like your mom and pop, well, not mom and pop, but your, you know, Jane and, and Dylan don't have any idea about what's going on at Area 51 
you know, in the uh, upfront personnel, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's exactly kind of what he's, and and that also is believable, right? Yeah. Uh, And that's the thing about Bob Lazar's story is that I think it, uh, it, it is very well thought out in that, yeah. you know, there are a lot of gaps, but then there's just ways to kind of just go around them. Yeah. You know, go around yeah, each little thing, dude. every inconsistent. I don't necessarily want to call them inconsistencies because the story itself is relatively consistent and it has been consistent for the past, I mean, what is it? 30, 40 years. Yeah. Um, but in terms of like all of these gaps in the story where there should be some sort of evidence or, or some sort of stop, there are little nice ways of getting around it. Government's a hell of a drug, dude. It is. Well, Chris, I got a special little clip for you that I think you're going to like uh, when it comes to these aliens, right? And these crafts. Bob thinks that they're ancient. Ancient aliens. I mean, now this is my own personal opinion. So don't cast this in stone. I, I believe that these were part of some sort of archaeological dig. Now, I don't have any evidence. I didn't read anything like that, but it's, it's just, I, that's the, that's the feeling I got, Um, you know, because they're talking about the, you know, how long these things have been around. So, um, so that's, to me, this, this is one of my favorite things about Bob Lazar is that his story is very fun. I was going to say, dude. So it's like the 1990s classic Stargate. Yes, basically. That's awesome. Yeah, we we did a dig, and what's he he's really good at saying like this is what I saw, and this is kind of what uh, I'm theorizing, but I don't know this yeah. for a fact. And that's one of the things is like I think it was part of a dig. I think these were left here a really long time ago. I don't think that we captured a crash UFO. Uh, I think that we found these and started experimenting on them. And wow, I love that idea. Dude. That's such a fun idea, dude. That kind of explains, you know, like why Hitler was going up into the mountains of the Himalayas, dude. Why the Nazis were going into Antarctica. They were looking for more crashed aircraft. Oh, now we're going to Nazis and aliens. We moved from moon bases. Well, the Nazis had moon bases. (laughs) Oh, dude. Dude. (laughs) The Nazis then became Americans. History Channel got to you way too young. (laughs) Way too young. <laughs> Paul, the Nazis just become Americans. They needed to have like stronger age warnings on ancient aliens when we no, were growing man, up. This is was, a problem. No, this is all true. Every bit of it. This is this is this is fact. All right, so, but keep going. I'm having a great time, dude. I can't believe Bobby likes the ancient aliens theory. Bobby likes ancient aliens, which I honestly like the best. To me, it makes more sense than all of these craft are constantly crashing. Yeah. You know, it's like some crashed over long periods of time. Thousands upon maybe even millions of years. These, these craft have, have, you know, you, they may not have even like fallen from, from like to earth. Right. They, it wasn't even that they were coming to earth. They like broke down, you know, in the solar system somewhere or something and just got captured by our gravitational field. I think the odds of that are pretty slim, considering how big the uh, the Milky Way is. Hence, why we only have nine of these jokes. They're just all. It's like the universe. The Milky Way is just one giant junkyard, and it's they're just cute. constantly look, crashing into planet. Look around our own, like solar. You know, just our solar system, dude. Just directly above Earth. Earth. It is a trash field, dude. <laughs> It's becoming such a problem that like all these broken down satellites that they're like, uh, we're going to have to like pick up our trash somehow, dude. And they have no idea how to do it. All right. So, well, the other fun thing about this too, uh, and once again, this is just having fun with this idea is that if they are ancients, then what we could be seeing is not a bunch of different models of the same type of craft. It could be different iterations over a long period of time where we have like the model T but yeah. then we also got like a 1950s Chevy and then we got like a Tesla. You know what I mean? It's like well, a lot of different time periods. It's probably also different civilizations. Yeah. Could right. Be. It could be the reptoids in the Nords and the Greys. Well, hold on. Hold on, Chris. The reptoids are from the hollow earth. You're right. But they also had UFOs. though. That's true. So I guess they could have crashed one. Yeah. But it, yeah, it just wouldn't be falling to earth. It would be coming from the inside. It would be coming from the inside and then crashed on the surface where only idiots stay. <laughs> only assholes who live on surfaces go. 
Don't you know, Chris? I know. No one goes to the surface. Now, here's a really interesting story because one of my favorite parts of this is actually George Knapp's experience because I trust what George Knapp says, honestly, quite a bit. Right. And George Knapp, I think he fails to be skeptical enough in this interview, which he did produce the movie. So I think I kind of know why. I love right, that part yeah. out. I should have mentioned that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a very important, important part to uh, to stipulate. Yeah, he, he was involved in the making of the movie, but he also has criticized Bob in, in conversations uh, during different conferences saying that he doesn't believe that Bob went to MIT or that Bob went to Caltech. And he basically says, like, listen, it doesn't discredit Bob entirely. It's just something that we should talk about. But, like, I don't think he went to these schools. Really? Um, That's kind of interesting. And basically, he's like, listen, Bob wouldn't be the first person to lie on his resume to get a job. A lot of people do that. He just needs to admit to that because everyone's getting stuck on it because he got, like, really bad grades in high school, apparently. And everyone's like, there's no way this guy went to MIT. They would not have let him in. Well, I I just love that he picked, like, the two best engineering schools in the nation, dude. He's like, oh, if I'm going to lie, I might, I might as well lie my pants off. You know yeah. what I mean? But it's not an engineering degree from American Samoa. You know? <laughs> you shoot for the top, dude. He's going, he's going straight to the top. It's like a lawyer saying, I went to Harvard Law School. And so, you don't even have a law degree. Yeah, yeah, it's basically that. So George had quite a few things happen to him. Like, number one, phone star getting tapped at the radio station. Naturally at it when it became clear that my own phone at the KLAS was being monitored. The reason I figured out that my phones were tapped is there there were six people, six different people who didn't know each other who had called to give different pieces of information that verified or supported various versions of of this story, that uh, there had been a secret project like this out there, and all six of these people were visited by someone who told them to shut up. Now, it was different someones, different agencies. Uh, in one case, it was a, a lady who was visited by some guys who worked for a defense contractor out there who reminded her that she was still under uh, under security uh, limitations. Okay. All right. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. And he, he goes on because they actually threatened one of his sources. Okay. Like, yeah, let's hear that. And they said, uh, they told her, We know that you travel back and forth to see your daughter in L.A. We know that she comes here. It's a real big desert out there. We'd hate for something bad to happen. Now, I don't know that somebody would actually carry out a threat like that from our government. It was more meant to intimidate uh, this woman who was prepared to share with me some really interesting information. But it worked on her. Yeah. So they they shut down his sources, man. Dude, my favorite way that people find out they're getting tapped is when they forget to pay their phone bills and their phone doesn't shut off and they like, (laughs) don't pay it for like a couple of months. And they're like, yeah, I'm being tapped by the government. Yeah. They're keeping this open for a reason. Yeah. They're keeping this open for a reason. reason. So, uh, I mean, that's okay. I mean, George Knapp saying that it happened is definitely a positive to the story, but, uh, we're going to get into my theories later, but I do want to keep on getting into this. All right. So that's that's a bit of George Knapp's experience. So, you know, he not only can validate how scared Bob was, he didn't actually see anyone following Bob, but he knows he saw Bob hanging out with the newsies, super paranoid. All right. That's right. something. Uh, George Knapp was then, he says that he was wiretapped and that his sources were threatened. That's, right. that's something, right? That's a little yeah. something. Yeah. Um, at one time, Bob did claim to have some element 115. And uh, nev- no one ever saw it. He never shared it with anyone. Um, he was recently, um, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? The FBI came and searched his his offices, right? So that is actually an additional uh, interesting point that they never get to in this conversation, which annoys me. So yeah. I'll show you the dumb segue that Nap does and then never gets back to it. Okay. I was going to ask, Bob, whether you're still monitored, but I we found out that I guess you are, at least to some degree. You had a, you had some visitors recently. We're, I, I don't think we're going to get into the details now because we've got to go to a break. Uh, but maybe before the end of the program, we can. We're going to go uh, into the break and then uh, take some calls. Yeah, they never like, go into the break and we never hear anything about it, do we? Yeah, you were just like searched by the feds and we don't bring that up. Uh, so for me to bring it up, because I looked into it quite a bit, he was searched uh, by by the police, right? And it was in connection with a murder case. Oh, yeah. 
Now, this is used as uh, a point against Bob by his critics, right? There are two main points where he got in trouble with the law. One was he got caught running a prostitution ring. That's not great. <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, he was running a prostitution ring. What? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and it was Dude, illegal. I Bob believe... Lazar was running a prostitution ring? Yeah, I, I believe it was in Nevada. That dude has zero pimp inside him. <laughs> no, it was the it was verified that there were prostitutes who were interviewed by Bob Lazar to be a part of the cat house that he was attempting to run. Okay, okay, so it was more like a conspiracy to be a pimp, and he was never actually successful. I believe he was actually running it, and that's what okay. he got in trouble for. Uh, okay. Because I, I th- my understanding is that it was in Nevada. Where I believe they legal. called them bunny ranches, Paul. Is that what they call them? Yeah. When I was there, they kept calling them cat houses. Cat uh, houses. Maybe that. Maybe that's the preferred number. Who knows? Sure. But uh, he wasn't doing it legally. There's a bunch of loops, hoops that you have to jump through, and he was not following this. We got in trouble for that. So people will try to say he was running a prostitution ring. Uh, it seems that it was in a location where you're able to do that. Um, I could be wrong. I need to double check that. Oh. That's fascinating, dude. Yeah. Not the guy on you know my list of purveyors of the flesh yes he is Bob Lazar is not at the top of my list okay okay so that's definitely um we'll put that in the morally dubious category (laughs) that's fair that's a fair point now the second one is the fact that he was rated in connection with a murder case now I don't think that is entirely fair to Bob And the reason why is because it's the case of this guy who murdered his girlfriend using a chemical that he purchased from Bob. Okay. In my humble opinion, that is not entirely fair to use that against Bob because he does have a company where he sells chemicals and he sells a bunch of different like scientific equipment. Right. And if someone buys something from you and then does something bad with that thing, the police will come and they will investigate and like they searched, I guess, his email servers to see what communication he had with the guy. But that doesn't mean that Bob knew anything about it. He has chemicals and chemicals can kill people. And yeah. I've seen no evidence that Bob knew that this would be used in a murder. Um, it was someone misusing the stuff that his company legally sells. Anti-gun people are going to love that little segment. They probably, it's not the guns that kill people, Chris. <laughs> it's the person, okay? And for that gun people aren't going to love that, Paul. Yeah, Holy but go. <laughs> no, no, but, but seriously, like if, if you are selling scientific equipment and someone misuses it, yeah, I, I don't think that it's that if you're selling it legally, I don't think you can hold that against the person. There you go. Right. Yeah, I don't know. And I don't think that's a couple to do hundred guns. years of English, British law, dude. You're just slapping it away. Love it. <laughs> that's not how that works at all. All it. right. Anyways, I don't. So I don't think that one's completely fair. Uh, I love it. No, I'm, that, I'm right there with you, dude. That is why that, you it, searched by the cops. It was the OFI, you know, sending their goon squad in to to find the alien stuff that bob lazar had hidden that's what he says he says that this was a cover for the feds to get into his house and take his element 115 away goon squad dude for sure so he's still being still being hunted by the by the federal government not surprising he's still alive yeah so we got a couple got a couple callers chris that we'll jump into okay so number one caller comes in says you know hey do you regret coming out and telling this story? Hello there, George Knapp. Great show. I'm telling you, <laughs> buddy, you and that Bob was here, and I got a great question for him. Watch this guy's voice, man. Incredible. It's amazing. Hey, I'll tell you what, buddy. If you could roll the clock back to 1980s, would you have come forth with all this information, or would you have just kept your mouth shut? Good, good question. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times people ask me that question, and I have to admit, I answer it differently from time to time. I mean, it, you know, I'm, but I'm really leaning towards if I could go back in time is just not say anything. It really has been, it's been a crazy ride, and uh it's look a lot of people don't believe the story anyway which is true a lot of people don't believe it yeah a lot of people don't believe it a lot of people don't know who he is and it sounds like he's had a pretty awful time throughout the last decades 
Yeah, and I think it can be argued both ways, right? Because he did sell his his story as movie rights to a yeah. large production company. He did write a book. He also has been attacked by a lot of people and he doesn't really do a lot of public appearances. Yeah. So I'm not sure how much he actually enjoys being public facing because if, if he loved it as much as some of the critics say he loves it, I just feel like he'd be out there more often. Right, definitely. Like, it was a pretty big lull from like the early 90s to today that he wasn't really doing much besides right. selling like UF or saucer guy mugs on his company's website. It was like the right. that he was doing. So, the saucer guy. Saucer, saucer guy. You're saucer guy. You're the saucer so, guy. Little, little quick call here. A caller calls in and gives George Knapp a hot lead. And I'm still waiting to see if anything came of this. But this lady seems to have a bit of information about Area 51. Okay. Just calling in randomly and dropping I can't, I can't wait. Well, um, I just want to first tell you my father was a uh, head accountant from Bob Bancy, Van Compernal. And he signed the checks. He probably signed yours back then. Um, the government came to him also and tried to stop him from, you know, he wanted him to hide all the information of all the Area 51 and S4 and other areas. Kathy, if you wouldn't mind, would you leave, leave your number with uh, Donna? Uh, my colleague there at Coast, before you leave. So this chick's dad, she says, was like an accountant for Area 51 and was signing everyone's checks. <laughs> and the government threatened him to hide it. We Area finally 51. found the HR guy. <laughs> George, finally... is like, George is like, yo, can you, uh, can you leave us your number, please? But see, dude, she sounded crazy. She definitely sounded crazy. Like Bob Lazar... I was I was actually taken aback how like normal and collected he sound through most of this of this uh, episode. Yeah, I mean, granted, he's probably told this story a million times now, but still, you know, you always get like a blah, 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 you know with your crazy people, and like he doesn't have any of that. Yeah, and I think that's one of the lures is that he's like very calm, he's soft spoken, uh, and you know he tends to stick to his story pretty well. You know that's how he convinced all those ladies of the night to work for him. That's exactly what did it, dude. That's a pimp that you want to work for. It seems level headed, real, the real nice, calm, nerdy guy. They're yeah. like, we can take advantage of this man. This will be chill. This is the <laughs> chill show. <laughs> we'll take advantage of this man, no doubt. Yeah. So. That's what we have today, Chris. I think we ran a bit over time, but that is the story of Bob Lazar, the saucer guy, um, and how he met George Knapp and made his little documentary, I guess. It, we do it, it's a it's definitely a fascinating story, but Paul, let me let me drop a little bit of my conspiracy. Well, before we get into that, I did oh, have okay. one final clip actually. Yeah, one Chris. final clip. Okay. Just to put a little pin in this. This is Corbell's final pitch for watching his movie. The whole thing was filled with his pitches to the point that it drove me insane and I cut them all out, but I want to give the audience a little taste of how hardcore he was pitching this <laughs> freaking movie. It's time to take the mic back and that's exactly what we're going to do for the world premiere on December 3rd and I couldn't be more excited about it. The movie's great. It's uplifted. You haven't seen anything like it. You ain't done nothing right in your life until you watch it. So please do me a favor. Enjoy my film. Thanks, Jeremy. Bob, any final comment? Good, always good to talk to you. Well, it's always good to be here. I just wish your show was on a decent hour. <laughs> Bob, don't we all? Oh, God, I love it. Just comparing Corbell's like, like ending pitch, like, go see my movie. I haven't done anything right until you've done it. And yeah. it's like, Bob, what's your last word? He's like, I wish your show was on earlier. <laughs> Well, I'm pretty tired. I typically go to bed around 9.30 p.m., and it's uh, about 3 a.m. in the morning. So It's hard to not enjoy it. You know, it's yeah. a fun guy. It's so good. It's yeah. so good. And, yeah, dude, he was selling it hard. I yeah. wonder if they got a pretty good return on investment on that documentary. I feel like they have because it's streaming now. And I remember when it came out, people at my work were bringing it up to me, like, have you seen the new Bob Lazar documentary? Like, you got to watch it. <laughs> and I don't work with kooks, dude. I work with yeah. normies. Tech, uh, the tech bros, dude, they love them some aliens. You got to love the aliens. Uh, well, Chris, sorry to interrupt. Let's get back to your conspiracy. Let's hear it. So my general, and this has been developing more and more and has recently only come into real fruition since UFOs 
have re-hit the mainstream, you know, Congress is getting into it and, you know, freaking representatives and senators are talking about UFOs. And when you bring these type of people into the UFO conversation, dude, I immediately become skeptical of like any kind of extraterrestrial or something. Part of me does believe that what may actually be happening here is that people are seeing secret, top secret, and whatever you know, Q clearance level technology. And what the government is doing is almost like some kind of you know psychological operation limited hangout, right? where you send the government thugs to come and like kind of go over a place or, you know, like scare some people. You better not talk about this. You know what I mean? And people would be like, oh my God, the aliens thing that I was talking about is totally true. And so like, I, it's like a weird operation that's going on. You know what I mean? I bet some of these people who talk about UFOs all the time, are like somehow connected to like the NSA or the CIA and they're like double plants essentially. Well, and it could also be a situation of people are going out there and then trying to describe these like weird, you know, aerial craft that they see. And the reason why they're being threatened isn't because they're calling them aliens, but it's because they're actively describing top secret projects. Right. Uh, Even if they don't know exactly what it is, that could also be a reason, you know, and I think there's a, a lot of interesting things about what these UAPs could be, especially like what the government's seeing. Like Neil deGrasse Tyson is very skeptical about this. Yeah. And basically what he says is like, you know, in science, we don't say like, you know, this object was a hundred degrees Fahrenheit. We say the thermometer we were using registered a right. hundred degrees Fahrenheit. And it's like so many of these videos and so much of what's being seen is like off radar or off of the technology attached to these these aircraft that we're flying around in and they could be misreading something right we don't necessarily know if there's something out there that is an aliens that we are misreading or like you said it could be some sort of top secret projects that you know senators aren't being told about well and i think you know like in the 1970s when they were developing the sr-71 blackbird which was the first stealth plane there was a whole rash of UFO sightings. That was the that was the flaming cross one, right? Right. Yeah, where people were seeing flaming crosses in the sky and like pilots were reporting flaming crosses. And, and it was it was like a stealth jet that they were seeing. It was a stealth jet. And I and you know, so I I so and again, dude, we know the government lies to us. Mm-hmm. And they would do everything in their power to like ensure that whatever this secret technology is doing you know whatever it is that they've developed you know there's factions within the government and like they are at odds with each other and so i I have no i you know more and more i wanted i want them to be aliens i so want them to be aliens but a part of me believes that it is like (laughs) a government cover-up and not that it's aliens, they're just covering up their own technology. Yeah, it could be. Or it could just be something dumb. That it's, yeah. you know, it's like when you t- find out what's behind a magic trick and you're like, ah, oh, damn, that was yeah. lame the whole time. The whole it, time. It could be something like that. Yeah. I don't know. Well, when it comes to Bob Lazar, Chris, on a scale of one to five sports models. Yes. What, what do you give his story and why? Uh, I'm going to give it at least three sports models. I thought it was a pretty good story. I can buy that. He was at least a contractor and maybe had some secret or top secret clearance to go with that. And that he was possibly looking at secret top secret Q level clearance, whatever it was technology. I I'm not that skeptical of his element 115 claims either i mean i again 
going back to what we were just talking about, I think there is a bunch of technology that our government has access to in the deep bowels of the bureaucracy that we have no idea about. You know what I mean? I think of I think of MK Ultra and what they were doing with, you know, different chemicals and psychotropics and stuff back in the 50s and 60s. And so like how far has that technology gotten? And so it, it doesn't surprise me if a lot of these things that he's saying are true, that, you know, he did see something that looked what he considered to be a UFO when he was working on Area 51. So I'm going to give him like more than half. All right. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. You know, so what? like three, I, I think three yeah. sports cars. I was going to say three women of the night, actually. <laughs> okay. You know, life would be so much easier if the government documents from like the 60s and 70s didn't get declassified and we weren't like, oh, you were doing MK Ultra. Oh, you were trying to blow up Fidel's cigar. Yeah. Like, all the crazy stuff the government did came out. We're like, oh, we really can't trust y'all. Yeah. Y'all are yeah. crazy. And, uh, a, a dude, no. and, you know, that's a limited hangout there. Yeah. You know what I mean? They, they still haven't told us about Kennedy. They're still they're still hiding JFK. Stuff. They're still hiding JFK from us, dude. What what JFK document is still critical to national security? I'm not certain, but they're still hiding. They're, they still do it. They still do it. They literally killed a Haitian prime minister, dude. Yeah. Just killed him. Yeah. So I you don't think our government had anything to do with that in the Western Hemisphere. No, they definitely did on that one. Um. So yeah, Bob Lazar gets three women of the night, dude, for sure. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give him honestly. If, if so, I need to adjust my rankings here, like what I'm ranking on, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start ranking based on how much I actually believe it. Okay, uh, with Bob Lazar, I'm gonna I'm gonna give him a one. I don't really believe it. I think that it is it's a very fun story. I love listening to him talk, and I love Bob Lazar as science fiction. Like I I almost I'm about to buy his book and just kind of see what's in his book. But when it comes to this project, how certain he is that there's only 22 people, he says that he had the total list um, and no one's ever been able to find his boss because he's like the only name that they've actually given out. And, you know, it, I just have a really hard time believing that that's how the government's going to investigate UFOs. And there's just never no one else has ever come out and corroborated anything that he said. He's never shown element 115, even though he pretended like he had it. I just feel like there's so many places where there could be some sort of shred of evidence and none has ever shown up that it makes it hard for me to, to believe it like 40 years later, you know? Right. But I want to believe it. Dude, I'm telling you, I wish it was aliens. I, I really do. Yeah. But our government is just full of jabronis. And I love the idea that there were, you know, nine craft that we found yeah. because it is, it's very... You know, uh, Stargate, like you said, it's very expanse. Yeah, you know, like with the proto molecule. I love exactly. that idea, of science yes. fiction. So it's fun. so good. Yeah, but um, you know, until there's something that that can actually back up what he says, I just I don't think one guy who says he's a physicist at Los Alamos really proves anything to me. Maybe those uh, Ethiopian Christians have a little piece of UFO inside their church, and that's <laughs> what they think the Ark of the Covenant is. That's why all the priests are going blind. That's why they're all going blind. Because they're staring into element 115. Uh, yeah, that's a little callback to our Graham Hancock episode. So listeners, please go Check back, it out. listen to those. Two-parter, part one, part two. It was a great episode. Well, Chris, thank you for talking with me today. This has been George Knapp's interview with uh, Bob Lazar and Jeremy Colbell. Um, I think that's all we got for you. All conspiracy? Yeah, all the time. Later.